So last week, we looked at how Jesus is Lord, and that is the center of the good news. One of the things I said was that Jesus is Lord over Caesar, meaning Jesus is in charge of temporal power. But it's important for us to understand not just that he is Lord over temporal power, but also how he is Lord over temporal power. Sometimes, as his people, we can assume that we are his representatives, and therefore it is our job to make sure that the world conforms to God's kingdom. And so we try to force people to behave in a certain way. When we do so, we misunderstand that the cross doesn't just mean that we have a new boss, but that power takes a completely different shape. You see, Jesus' greatest act of power is laying down his life on the cross. And if that is the paradigm for what power is, then it obviously means that we have to reconsider our idea of what power looks like. Jesus doesn't overpower Caesar at his own game. Jesus shows us a different way of power. So we can compare these two types of power. The first is the most familiar type of power to us. It's the kind of power that allows us to get people to do what we want them to do, whether they want to do it or not. We can call this coercive power. We see it all around us. Employers can terminate employees who don't do what they want, except, you know, when Labor laws get in the way, but um, within a social circle, the alpha male or the queen bee can tell the others to exclude a person who disfavors them. Or a uh, parent can send their child to bed with no supper. Or the government can take your stuff or your freedom if you don't listen to it when it tells you things that you must do or things that you must not do. All of these forms of power rest on an, basically on a threat. If you don't do what I want you to do, I will take something away from you that is valuable to you. But on the cross, Jesus doesn't make any threats. Jesus demonstrates God's love, showing the world its depth in order to persuade rather than coerce. And so we can call this loving power and contrast it with coercive power. Loving power means giving ourselves and our status away as an act to disarm hatred and enmity. With loving power, Jesus forsakes his own glory, coming in the form of a baby in a manger. With loving power, Jesus sets aside his status and washes his disciples' feet, the thing that is the work of the lowest slave in a household. With loving power, Jesus willingly allows himself to be crucified for the sake of humanity's salvation. Jesus shows us how God, using loving power, does not need the power of coercion to accomplish his goals. Now, if Jesus' humility was merely a means to an end, in a way of, of tricking people to crucifying him so that he can save all humanity, then you can imagine that the risen Christ would behave quite differently. Guess who's back? Oh, you thought you could crucify me? Well, let me show you what it feels like when I crucify you. But that's not what Jesus does, is it? Instead, Jesus sends a group who have no coercive power into the world to persuade them that he is Lord. And he doesn't empower them with an army. He empowers them with a spirit who transforms them so that they can love like he loved. And this group of people, not an army, is what shows God's power. Paul, writing to the Corinthians, reminds them, brothers and sisters, think of what you were when you were called. Not many of you were wise by human standards, not many of you were influential. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose the foolish things of this world to shame the wise. God chose the weak things of this world to shame the strong. And God chose the lowly things of this world and the despised things and the things that are not to nullify the things that are so that no one may boast before him. So the church has no formal authority but it survives when coercive power tries to crush it. Almost immediately, the Jewish religious authorities start to persecute the church. The Sanhedrin arrests, threatens, and flogs the apostles. Herod puts James to death. 
And within 35 years, the Roman government has singled out the Christians for official imperial persecution, where it becomes the policy of the Roman Empire to put Christians to death because they're Christians. But the more the coercive power tries to align itself against the church and crush it, the more that it grows. And the power of God's love is far greater than the coercive power that stands in opposition to him. But then things change. In the 4th century, Christianity is legalized in the year 313 by Constantine. And one of his successors, Theodosius, makes it the official religion of the Roman Empire in 380. Christianity become, goes from being forbidden to tolerated to the official, religion, or the official religion of the empire within a single lifetime. Now, before the year 313, if you were going to become a Christian, it was going to deny you access to coercive power. You couldn't get the kinds of jobs that give you strong power, particularly with the, with the state. In fact, it was probably going to cost you your life, or there's a very good chance that it would. But after 380, now you would be denied from having coercive power because you weren't a Christian. And you can imagine what that does to the church, right? Suddenly, before... Everybody was committed to being a servant of Jesus and following his teaching because why would, on earth would you be a Christian if you weren't really committed to it? Why, why would you lay aside your own personal safety, your own ambition, to serve some guy that you don't believe in? But as the, as the church goes from being an outlawed sect to being the official, the official religion of the empire, suddenly things change. The number of people who identify as being Christian goes up and up and up and up. But as a percentage of them, the, the number of people who are committed to the teachings of Jesus goes down and down and down and down and down. Because there's a lot of people coming into the church, not because they see anything in Jesus that they want to replicate, but simply because either they feel like they're forced to, or because they feel it's politically or socially advantageous for them to do so. And so the state and the church join forces historians call that Christendom, and it's the state of affairs in the West for over 1,500 years. And in this deal, the, the, the state gives the church the power to enforce its moral vision on society, and in return, the state expects the church to justify its actions, even when those actions are unjustifiable. And so, for instance, in, uh, in living memory, the... Uh, the Nazi party in Germany had the, uh, the church there say that uh, what they were doing was perfectly acceptable, and most of the church went along with them. Now, in North America, Christendom has collapsed. In Canada, particularly, it's happened in the last 60 or so years since the Quiet Revolution began. And we see this because church attendance is not what it used to be. When they uh, implemented the current round of uh, public health policy and said that we could only have 50% capacity, that really didn't affect any of the churches in Kirkland Lake because we were all built at a time when there were a lot more people went to church. The end of Christendom has reduced the prestige of the church. People don't think that Christians are fine, upstanding people. Oftentimes people in society look at Christians as backwards or intolerant or terrible or ignorant or whatever. And the public morality no longer reflects church's teaching. It used to be that the public uh, deferred to the church on moral issues, and now public morality is very different from the church's morality and often very uh, uh, inconsistent with the traditional teachings that the church has, has made. Now, this social dislocation has led to a lot of anxiety among Christians because it can feel like we're losing ground for the kingdom. Many Christians feel that we need to use whatever means are within our grasp, no matter how ruthless, in order to get that power back. Last month, while he was speaking to a rally of evangelicals, Donald Trump Jr. said, we've turned the other cheek, and I understand sort of the biblical reference. I understand the mentality, but it's gotten us nothing, okay? It's gotten us nothing while we've ceded ground in every major institution in our country. So this sense of loss has led some Christians to question whether or not we need to set aside even the teachings of Jesus in order to regain the power that we had in order to, presumably, to bring God's kingdom here on earth. 
But maybe this fall from power that the church is experiencing isn't just a secularist plot. Maybe it's a divine blessing. Maybe it's good news. The church changed the world without any coercive power for the first few hundred years of its existence. Instead, it used spirit-empowered love to demonstrate who God was. But in the last 1,500 years, as we have enjoyed the protection of the state, we've become addicted to coercive power, and we often don't understand how God could possibly achieve his goals without us exercising that power. And I think then for our own sake, God takes it away from us as a divine act of tough love. We were never meant to legislate or coerce others into building God's kingdom. We were meant to love and serve them. That's why Jesus says, you know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their high officials exercise authority over them. Not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant. And whoever wants to be first must be your slave. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. Jesus exercises loving power, demonstrated in his self-sacrificial love, and he calls us to follow his example. But oftentimes we've tried to build God's kingdom by disobeying God's command. And when we do that, we say that we know better. Yeah, I know, God, that you want a kingdom of justice and mercy and peace, but you can't expect us to build that by being just and merciful and peaceable. You know, you got to break some eggs to make an omelet. So just turn a blind eye while we do that, and we'll get you to this kingdom that you want, as if we know better about how to achieve God's kingdom than God knows. And so sometimes we can feel like we're pulled in two different directions. On one hand, we see that Jesus tells us that we are supposed to love people, that that is the crux of what the Christian faith is. But on the other hand, we feel that the demands of God's kingdom pull us in another direction. After all, there are heretics to burn and sinners to shame. But our error is in thinking that it's our job to build God's kingdom. God builds God's kingdom. We don't build it. Jesus never tells his followers to build a kingdom. Rather, he invites them to enter or receive the kingdom. And we enter and receive the kingdom when we accept God's authority unreservedly in our own life. And so if every person in this room were to unreservedly give their will over to God, then we would experience the kingdom of God here in our midst. I know it's, human beings are broken and flawed, and so that's a little bit of an overreach. But just as a thought experiment, that's what the kingdom of God would look like. And so inasmuch as our, our wills are yielded to God, we are living his kingdom. We are entering and receiving that kingdom. So the notion that we can somehow build God's kingdom by disobeying the commands that Jesus has given to us is, is an absurd contradiction. While God builds his kingdom, though, that doesn't mean that we don't have anything to do. That doesn't mean that we're supposed to sit on our butts and learn to play harp for the clouds or something like that. Rather, God invites us to build for the kingdom. As an analogy, imagine that God is a great architect, and he's building a temple. And he says, I'm going to decide what this temple looks like, its, its dimensions, its height. I'm going to decide the kind of materials that are used in it. I want to decide the schedule about when things get built. But, hey, my beloved children, I want to give you something meaningful to do in this process. So can you go to the quarry and cut out some blocks of stone? Okay. And so God sends us into the world. And every time we practice an act of radical generosity, tink, 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 we're baking stones to build the temple. Every time we extend unexpected forgiveness, tink, 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 we're making blocks for the temple. Every time we give value to a person who has been despised and rejected by society because we believe that they were made in God's image, tink, 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 we are building blocks for the temple. Now, we don't have to know where each of these blocks is going to sit in the finished product. We don't have to know the design of the temple in order to build the blocks. We just need to, to build the blocks. And so how God is going to take these acts of hospitality and mercy and love and kindness and faithfulness and turn these into a kingdom is a mystery to us. But that's the way that God rolls. When Jesus came 
to this world. No one thought that he could disarm the powers of evil by allowing those same powers to kill him. Jesus is welcomed in Jerusalem on Palm Sunday as a, as a liberator because the people believe that he's going to take it to the Romans, that he's going to seize control, he's going to lead a military rebellion and depose the Romans. And when he refuses to do that, they turn against him and call for his crucifixion because he's standing in the way of the kingdom that they assume that God is going to build. No one saw it coming that God would send Jesus to the cross and that that is the place where he would win this great victory. And so it's not our job to figure out how God will build a kingdom from our acts of faithfulness. It's merely our job to trust that he can and that he will and allow him to do that while we simply obey what Jesus had told us. Jesus shows us that God can use loving power, not coercive power, to do this. And so how is this good news? Well, first of all, I think that it frees us from the temptation of coercive power. Because the church has, in its history, exercised coercive power in a way that has not been consistent with the teachings that Jesus has given to us. We look at the Crusades, for example, or we look at the, uh, the wars that followed the Reformation or any number of things. And I think when we pray, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, God is answering our prayer. He's freeing us from the temptation of coercive power. But it's also good news because it means that we are not pulled in two different directions. We're not having to decide when is it appropriate to love people and when is it appropriate to be coercive in order to make God's kingdom happen here on earth. We simply have one job to do rather than two contradicting jobs. Our job, well, let's start with love your enemies, do good to those who hate you, bless those who curse you, and pray for those who mistreat you. That's our job. The rest, the rest is his job. And he is faithful. And that, my friends, is good news.